All right. Hello, everyone. This is Jack Bosch speaking and welcome to another episode of the Forever Cash Life Real Estate Investment Podcast, where we talk all about things about cash flow, land investing, but also about other things. And today we're going to talk about a really cool concept called Novation. Uh, we'll explain to you exactly how that works, but it's a cool way that you can make money on deals that you otherwise sometimes think you cannot make money on. All right, let's get started in just a second. Welcome to the Forever Cash Life Real Estate Investing Podcast with your hosts, Jack and Michelle Bosch. Together, let's uncover the secrets to building true wealth through real estate and living a purpose-driven life. All right, so we are back and our guest today, my guest today is Eric Brewer. Eric, how are you doing? Doing well, Jack. How are you? Fantastic. Fantastic. Glad, so glad to have you here. Eric and I are part of a mastermind of about 150 of the top real estate investors in the entire United States. And in one of the meetings, there was, uh, there was this concept talked about, about that people talked about, hey, we're doing deals through Novation that perhaps otherwise we could have not done. Now, at that point, I did not even know what Novation was. So after inquiring about it, I realized this would be a great, great subject to talk about today. But before we dive into the subject, Eric, introduce yourself a little bit and talk to us about that. Uh, just tell us a little bit of your backstory. Okay. Um, so I got started in, in real estate in 2006. Um, early in my career, I was uh, originally fresh out of high school, was in the U.S. Army and served my time in the U.S. military. And um, after uh, getting out of the military, I came back to my hometown in central Pennsylvania in York, PA, and decided to apply for a job that I found in the newspaper um, at a car dealership for a lot attendant or a lot porter. I forget the exact name of it, but um, applied for a job there, went in, got hired. And um, long story short, is over two years, I worked my way up from a entry level sort of lot attendant position to sales and then eventually sales management and then stayed in the car business for about eight years. Uh, got a little burned out with the car business. It was long hours and um, just the nature of the business was moving in a direction that wasn't super attractive to me. And um, right around the time that I had my, my, my oldest son, um, I was like, man, I don't think I can be a great father and a, and a, and a great sales manager. And one of those has to, to go. And uh, the obvious choice was obviously the job, right? So I gave the job up and started searching for something new. And uh, actually, about six months later, and once those I, little babies are born, it's like you can't give them back anymore. No, do you for want sure. Them, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so it, was, it was cool. It was a great time for me. It was actually, um, you know, uh, and I look back on it. It was kind of scary when I did it, but knowing what I know now, I had sort of built up enough confidence and enough experience that whatever I did after that, I was more likely to be successful than I would have been, you know, several years before that. So made a decision that I wanted to get into real estate. And I thought that a, a logical place to start was the financing aspect of real estate, because that was one of the things I felt that gave me an advantage. Um, I was very blessed to work at a car dealership. It was one of the largest in the, the region. We sold a couple hundred cars a month across three different locations. And one of the things we were really good at was understanding financing. And we had 10 different financing options for a client where let's say other dealerships maybe had two and it gave it a, a competitive advantage um, when people were considering where to buy their car. So um, I got trained on selling mortgages and um, was basically cold calling and doing refis in 2005, 2006. And uh, oddly enough, uh, my old boss that was the owner of the car dealership had sold the dealership and uh, tried being retired and it didn't he didn't enjoy retirement as much as he thought and uh, kind of dabbled in real estate a little bit and called me and said, hey man, I, I'm doing this thing like flipping houses and I think it could be big and and you and I worked pretty well together. What are you doing right now? <laughs> I said, well, I'm, wow. I'm selling mortgages. I'm kind of in real estate. So we had lunch a couple of days later and he was pretty pumped up about the vision of what it could be and thought that, you know, we had worked so well together for so many years at the car dealership that we decided to go into business together. And um, so that's how I got into real estate. And that was 2006. 
Um, we bought a couple houses, made a little bit of money, made a bunch of mistakes. And then our first full year in business, we did 70 or so fix and flips, wow. um, quickly grew to over a hundred. And then by our third year, we were doing 200 plus transactions a year. And now our business does around the 350, 400 mark. And we have a blended business of um, wholesale fix and flip turnkey rentals, buy and hold. Um, and about 40% of that business is by way of Novation, which I think you and I are going to dive into a little bit deeper here today. We are, absolutely. And you also told me, we'll talk about that later on, that you're also getting into the build to rent space, right? And there might be some nice overlap with our students that do land flipping that yeah. uh, could perhaps provide, find you some, some good land that you that you can build houses on. We'll talk about that later on towards the end when we give out your content information. So, right, wow, that's 350, 400 deals. That is serious in the house industry. That's a serious, serious business. How big is your team for that? Uh, we have just shy of 40 full-time employees. Wow, congratulations. I mean, that's a, that's a heavy lift there. Thank right you. There. Sure so, uh, with that said, let's, let's dive into innovation. So I'm going to pretend to be completely stupid about the subject. and just going to ask you as like a complete beginner. I was like, okay, what the heck is innovation? Okay. Um, so I like to give some context to, to explain, because a lot of people think that, you know, I invented Novations or somehow dreamt this up. And that's certainly not the case. They, they, they have been around the Novation language um, and real estate law has been around for 200 years. The particular application where I've found a ton of traction, I think, is one of the things that I was probably one of the early people to, to sort of experiment with and figure out. And that started, um, if you think about fixing and flipping in 2006, 2007, it was the wild west. Like there was literally people getting mortgages with 550 credit scores that were 80, 20 loans and non-conforming subprime lending. And we were selling homes to, you know, people that, you know, generally today wouldn't qualify for a mortgage. And not only were they able to get a mortgage, they were able to do it with very little money down plus 6% sellers help all that good stuff. So yeah. the market changes. We literally probably had, I don't know, 25 or 30 properties in escrow that were sold. And I think 100% of those deals went sideways. Um, over the course of about 30 days, um, I got phone calls from agents and lenders that said, hey, that, that deal's dead, that, that loan product's been pulled, that lender's out of business, or we're no longer able to find a PMI company. There was a thousand different reasons, but you know, the floor fell out from under us. So uh, we right. quickly went from a market, I think, prior to 2007, 2008, in our market, less than 5% of mortgages that were originated were FHA to over 75% post the crash. So what happened was, um, as soon as that crash and everybody went to FHA, if you think about that now from a flipping perspective, there's a lot of seasoning issues and FHA is not the most desirable loan product for a house flipper because of those seasoning issues. You got to hold the property for more time than you would if you sold it to a conventional buyer. But very early on after the, the, the crash, um, someone in Congress or in the government realized that, hey, we got a ton of distressed inventory here that's short sales and REOs, and we need to get this inventory purchased. Um, how do we incentivize investors to buy up this inventory? One of the ways that they did that is they passed a, a funding bill that was um, supported an FHA flip waiver. So it basically said that, hey, for this time being, for the length of this bill, um, there are no seasoning requirements or restrictions for FHA loans, right? So now we have all of this. I mean, this, this was, when that happened, our, our, our business personally took off. We were able to buy a ton of REO properties at deep discounts on the market and then sell to FHA borrowers, which were at that point over 75% of the buyer population was only able to get approved with an FHA mortgage. And now we didn't have any of the seasoning requirements, which made it much easier for us to do business. Well, around 2010, that bill expired. And I'm now doing you know 250 fix and flips, 75, probably closer to, I would say 90% of our business was FHA buyers because we, we hovered in that first time home buyer price range. And when the news came down that they were uh, no longer extending that flip waiver, I became nervous. 
right? I have all of this inventory. What does it look like if I have to hold this inventory for 180 days before I go to settlement with my buyer versus 90 days? And basically extending the, you know, the carrying cost and, and the exposure of all of my inventory doubled. So um, sat down with my attorney and said, hey, how how do we rectify this? What do we change? Like, how, how, do, how do I? In other words, at that point, uh, they, they, that waiver went away and you now went back to basically having to hold these properties that you buy for a certain amount of time, 90 days before you can uh, resell them. And, and that's obviously holding costs that cost money because these properties are not free, right? Yeah. And, and by the way, you got to remember how, you know, uh, volatile the, the values were back then, right? So it was more about like, I'm buying a house today and ARV is 200. It could be 180 in 180 days if I hold it, right? I could no, not have an appraisal concern right now because of comps and over six months that I'm holding this property, even if I have it under contract with a buyer, there could be a number of comps that settle, whether it's a bank owned or distressed seller or short sale that would impact my ability to be able to get appraised value, right? So just generally made me very uneasy. Um, and by the way, investor fix and flip deals were the most heavily scrutinized deals when it came to underwriting, right? Because that's where generally a lot of these large lenders saw massive loss when they were able to, you know, liquidate um, foreclosure inventory on the backside. They saw um, for a thousand different reasons. Bottom line is when they looked at their risk, there was more risk involved in a in a fix and flip situation. Uh, than there was on any other transaction. So we were heavily scrutinized, multiple, two, sometimes three appraisals, right? Um, safety inspections, plus all just the normal FHA guidelines. So that's where the Novation was introduced to me. Um, and we started using Novations. And bottom line is our attorney said, hey, the, the seasoning requirement um, becomes um, part of the, the the FHA guidelines when the deed is transferred. If you cannot transfer deed, but still have ownership interest in the property with the ability to market and sell it, you could bypass the FHA seasoning requirement. And that's where we saw the application of innovations in our transactions. Um, and as the market slowly started to recover, I was buying less and less properties off the MLS. Competition started to ramp back up when it came to, to bank owns and REOs. Um, we pivoted over those next five to six years to almost exclusively direct to sellers. So we're doing, you know, all the normal stuff like direct mail, outbound calling, um, pay per click, SEO. Uh, we're, we we spend quite a bit of time and energy on television as a, a lead source. So I'm buying today. Probably ninety percent of all of my deals come off market, um, which means innovations for us. Well, first, does, does, do you have any questions about the part that I just explained? I don't want to keep rambling on. It's no, easy. That, that, that makes sense. I mean, you basically showed that that at some point of time, this this food source kind of ended, like this deal source ended, and uh, the legislature and the things made it more difficult. So that comes innovation. But but now let's 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 talk about what is innovation. What happens when innovation when when you do innovation? What what does it even mean? Okay. So I think the best way to explain it, because nearly everybody understands an assignment, right? So an assignment is when you you put a property, a piece of land, a house, a storage facility, anything under contract, and that contract allows you to assign your interest in the property to a third-party buyer for whatever you decide that to be. You can sell it for less money, more money, or whatever happened, right? But the general wholesaling practices, we, we acquire property by way of a purchase agreement for $50,000. We find a qualified buyer that'll pay us 60, and we assign that contract and collect a $10,000 assignment fee, right? Novation, the actual word, I think, in Latin is new, right? It means newer replacement. So we're not assigning our contract, we're actually replacing our contract. So you can't have two enforceable contracts in play at one time, right? There's one that takes precedence over the other based on the day that it was signed or, or something about only one of those is enforceable. So basically, if I get a contract on a property for 100, I market and sell that property to, this is the key, a finance the buyer. FHA, VA, Fannie, Freddie, any conventional lending product that's not hard money or an investor loan, 
an assignment is a is not a financeable transaction, right? They okay. will not lend or insure uh, an assignment. It's not considered an arm's length transaction. They will not lend on it. The novation is a lendable transaction. So where most people, whether it's land or houses, when they wholesale, they buy at wholesale and then they sell at wholesale, right? right. Less than fixing and flipping it. But generally what we do is we sell to another cash investor that was willing to pay us more than what we what I we usually pay. say you buy super cheap and you sell cheap. Correct. Here with innovation, you can buy super cheap and sell at retail to a financed buyer. Because if you think about today's market, um, there's obviously a ton of investor activity, but the people that pay most in any market that you're in is a financed owner occupant. So as a investor, when you acquire at super cheap, you can exit at not so cheap, right? So, so, finance, so a finance and uh, retail buyer is basically Jim and John Smith uh, or Jim and Susie Smith. And they are having a loan. They're getting their pre-approved. They're getting a loan from FHA or from their from somewhere like that. Yes. And they pick this property and the market value is 400 and they're willing to pay 400 or even 420, whatever they send yeah. in this market right now. Yeah. And, and so they're going and they're getting approved for the loan, right? Yes. Okay. So that's that's one way, right? Where we're already buying at a discount, but we can exit at retail. So just imagine for a second, if one out of every five deals that you do, which is on on average what we see with with folks that that implement innovations, they're able to take it from a buy super cheap, sell cheap to buy super cheap, sell retail, right? So now you got, in most cases, double the margin is what we see, right? The other, I think, bigger picture is. You know, if you think about the offers that we make, on on average, we might close ten to twenty percent of the clients that we make offers to that are qualified sellers. Out of the ninety percent, let's say that say no to our offer, oftentimes we find that price is the only objection. They like most of what we have to say. They prefer the convenience of, of dealing with someone like us, and they're willing to sell and at a discount, but not at a deep enough discount to where it's super cheap. But maybe they'll sell it cheap, right? So let's imagine for a second in your analogy, they would sell it to us to what our investor would pay, maybe a little bit more. Well, that deal doesn't work for us because I can't make money wholesaling that. But I can write it up a hair above cheap and now convert that to a profitable transaction because I'm exiting it to a retail buyer. So there's two ways that we see that innovations create additional revenue. One, we're able to make more money on the deals we're already doing. Right, because we have this this understanding of this new dispo strategy, where we can strategically introduce novations in our transactions now that the seller has basically given us permission to list and market the property to a third party consumer. Right, and there's there's a so, ton of documents. In- let's say there's a deal that you can get. Again, it's a four hundred thousand dollar house, and in this case, the seller says, "No, I'm not going to give it to you for two fifty. I want three sixty for it." Yeah. I- and under normal circumstances, like, sorry, it's not a deal because it, it just not works. Now, in this scenario, you're basically getting the property under contract at 360. Yes. You're reselling it at 400. But why not do an assignment on that end? Why not? It's not a lendable transaction. You can't, you can't, you can't sell an assignment to an FHA borrower or a Fannie or you can't. Okay. So the buyer... If the buyer brings the sale, the purchase agreement in form of an assignment to his bank, the bank said, sorry, I can't finance that thing. All right. It's not going to happen. So in this case, what Innovation does, it's a document where you... What, cancel. What this- you cancel. Remember, it's replacement or new. So you effectively okay. cancel your purchase agreement. Okay. You cancel my purchase agreement and then... Sell it to the now you have an A to C agreement. So there's a new purchase agreement before the original seller and the new buyer. Oh, okay. and the novation so addendum says the novation okay. addendum says there's a conditional release of that original agreement in lieu of this third party agreement. It effectively says that you know me and Jack had an as is, no inspections, no commissions deal, and this new contract has all of that at a higher price. So I, in the addendum, absorb all of the additional obligations and any additional net proceeds, right? So it is kind of like an assignment just with different legal language. Yeah, it's an assignment for a wholesale style transaction 
but at retail values and retail buyers. Now, obviously, in the housing world, that only works for houses that are enough quality to qualify for an FHA loan. It doesn't really- Or, or any, it's, I mean, it's any, any, any non-investor loan will, will not do an assignment that I've seen. It's, it's, it's not a lendable, so it's not just FHA. This works in markets where, you know, we have, we have folks that are doing this in Hawaii and, and South Florida and, you know, uh, Idaho, like these areas where they're, they're, they're doing this on million dollar properties, right? So you're taking, um, basically, you're taking the property from uh, putting it on a contract with the seller for, again, let's say 360, and then you're marketing, you're finding a buyer at 400, and you're basically saying like, hey, listen, we're not going to do this with an assignment. We're going to do this with an innovation agreement which basically cancels out this first agreement and you're, you're now have a direct agreement with, with the seller. Correct. Okay. You were shaking your head a bit of it. Was I so a little bit incorrect in that? No, no, not at all. Um, no, I was more listening than, than shaking my head. Nothing that you said there was, was okay. anything other than completely accurate. Right. Um, so, what, so what I am, what I would encourage, like, it, so I just always tell people, we use language internally like assignments and innovations. We don't use any of that language with consumers. Right. Right. So, so yeah, yeah. That, that's probably, I, I didn't even realize I was doing it, but when I was shaking my head, I'm like, hold on for a second. That's not, we, we, we talk, we, we use slightly different language when we present these opportunities um, to sellers, just because. It, it means something different to them. And what, like, what do you say oh, to, a, to a buyer at that point? Uh, the buyer, nothing. Because to them, they're, they're buying the property from the seller. Like they, they effectively, um, we do all of these deals through the MLS, right? So to them, they see a property on the market, they're making an offer. They, they really don't even know that we're, we're a party to the transaction. The seller, when we're talking about the structure of this deal, we're really just talking about, hey, we need the opportunity to be able to market this property um, you know, to the, the, the largest pool of retail buyers out there in order to achieve this value that you desire. And in order to do that, we need to, to work with a real estate agent to do that. Not, we're not saying things like listing or MLS or anything like that. Um, we call it reasonable access, not right. showings. Okay. Right? Showings right. is so now, now this makes a hundred percent sense. So if I can summarize it for just a second, is like what I what I heard you say, what I understand you say is that in a normal wholesale transaction, you buy this four hundred thousand dollar property for two thirty, uh, or for two for two hundred. And you'd say like, it's a good deal for 200, then you flip it to another wholesaler for 250, let's say, right? And the wholesaler go gets a private money loan, no restrictions, nobody cares. There's no lending restrictions. It's the, it's the money from his uncle Bob, or it's the money from his local, uh, local uh, golf club members and things yep. like that. They don't care. They just buy that thing. He rehabs, he fixes it. Then he goes, sells it. And the buyer just gets a new loan. With this, this model does not work when... When, you, when, when, when the margin is thinner or uh, when, when people just want more money because right. you would have to bring up all the money to buy that thing and just the cost of that would just destroy the deal. Right? Correct. So in this case, what you do is you put them, but if you put them on a contract, an assignment doesn't work because your, your buyer cannot get a loan based on an assignment. Correct. The finance so buyer is not able to. Right? Yeah. Yes, you're correct. The finance buyer is not able to execute on that agreement um, by way of an assignment. Wonderful. Great. So uh, now what Novation does is it allows you to put it on a contract, have a Novation agreement with the buyer or put that in as an addendum. Uh, and therefore, now you step out of the deal. Uh, the buyer has a direct deal, but through the assignment, uh, to the addendum, you still get paid in the process. Right. right. Wonderful. That now brings me to the point of our, uh, a large majority or a lot of our listeners are land flippers. So with that means that and a lot of the land that you that is out there is actually free and clear. It doesn't even have mortgages. Not every land seller is willing to give you the 60, 70, 80 percent discounts that we're used to. But so this is totally applicable to this because you can take somebody as a five hundred thousand dollar piece of land. You're making a two hundred fifty thousand dollar offer. They don't accept it. They want four hundred for it. You can take that exact same deal and then flip it to somebody else that's willing to pay full market value or 450 and, and, but needs financing and also use the innovation agreement to make that process happen, right? Correct. Absolutely. All right. Yeah, so it's, it's applicable in any investment or any asset that, that I've ever seen where the bulk of, which is pretty standard, 
the opportunities that we get are not converted because of price, right? So we reach a point to where negotiations have fully exhausted their flexibility on price, but now they're willing to be flexible maybe on some other terms. Maybe that's for us on a house that's reasonable access and time, where initially our conversations were, say, you know, 14 day closes and, but their pricing expectations were high and we're asking for reasonable access to be able to show it to qualified buyers and 90 business days in order for us to have the time that we need to be able to, um, you know, market, locate and negotiate with that end buyer and for their mortgage to, to process to be facilitated. Any asset that you have where the bulk of your consumers are saying no because of price the implementation of novations will allow you to convert a fair portion of those people that are more price conscientious than they are term conscientious. Absolutely. And that's where, again, this comes in as an absolute valid strategy for mm -hmm. our land flippers, because that is a situation we come across every single day uh, in our, I mean, like, like with you guys, we, we might close one out of 25, 20 to 30 offers we make, Sure. So right here, some of them it's not worth it. It's not worth doing that for a ten thousand dollar property, but it's but particularly on the higher end uh, of the deals uh, where people are buying at higher rates too. This can be a very low risk uh, or no risk really way because uh, with innovation, the structure of the initial agreement doesn't change, right? Like you don't you don't have to put all of a sudden more as an escrow deposit or any escrow deposit and so on, right? No. Yeah, we generally unless it's a a big sticking point for the seller, which we're perfectly fine. But out of the 400 transactions or so that we'll facilitate this year, we'll probably put an earnest money deposit on less than 10% of those because it's not, it's generally, we, we have a history of performing and, you know, so um, we, we generally have minimal fallout, but yeah, our, 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 our deals are most often structured with no earnest money deposit. All right. and, and, and same here. It's like, it's extremely rare that somebody puts an earnest money deposit down. So this doesn't change. Really, nothing changes, but now it gives our it gives you another outlet to sell those properties because it allows the buyer to actually get financed. Now I got it. That's 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 the key thing. Well, when you think about it too, right? Like generally, if you're buying super cheap and selling super cheap, we're we're dealing with one niche of the potential buyer pool where we see the biggest opportunity with novations and housing is at the higher end price points, right? So like the investor activity. This may be the same for land. It's like if I get a acre of land that's you know I can sell for under fifty thousand dollars, I have a thousand buyers I can sell that to. Well, when it goes to a million bucks, that list gets a lot shorter, right? Well, we see the same thing in housing, right? Where like most of the investor activity at above three hundred thousand dollars in our market. It's, it's far less than it is at $150,000. So we would generally pass on higher price point properties because of our unfamiliarity or the days on market or the perceived risk where if I, was, if I weren't able to assign it and I was you know, held liable to perform on that contract, I'd have to close and own a, a $400,000 property. This now gives you the ability to convert more of those higher end, which generally, again, if you make a 10% margin on a $50,000 property versus a 10% margin on a half a million dollar property, you're getting paid a lot more, right? And the work's about the same. Like we, we work actually most of the time, I feel like I work harder on the deals I make $8,000 on than I do on the, the deals that I make $48,000 on, right? Yeah. No, it's same here. Um, so. Yeah, hundred percent, it, it, and it's the same thing. I mean, even in our in our model, the higher the value, the higher the offer we make. So we're already going to like 40, 50, 60 percent, 40, 50 percent offers on multi hundred thousand dollar properties. But now with this, you can potentially even go, particularly if it's an infill lot situation where you can finance it, because one of the things in land is you often don't get bank financing anyway. Right. So it's kind of like a mute point, but. On areas where you can get bank financing, on areas where you can get a loan uh, to, to a construction loan or something to build a house, that definitely plays a role. All right. Yeah. Well, wonderful. That is that is awesome. So I hope we just introduced to many of our watchers and listeners a new concept called Novation, right? That allows you to literally to pass on a deal to somebody else where they're basically truly stepping in your position, have a full contract with the seller, and that makes that financeable. And that allows you to actually take properties that otherwise you could not sell at retail uh, to go and put them out on retail on a retail market and 
and, and, and so on. So super excited with that. So now at the beginning, before we went live, you talk, I ask you like, well, Eric, how can we help you here with our community? And you mentioned that you're looking to build a whole bunch of built to rent houses and you need some land. Well, Eric, tell us where you're looking for land and our community, I'm sure, is going to jump in and uh, contact you. And then, of course, also tell us your contact information so the sure. community can reach out to you and see how they can help you find some land here. So generally speaking right now, um, within two hours of South Central Pennsylvania. So if you think of Harrisburg, it's probably the most notable um, location. That's 20 minutes from my office, um, an hour and a half um, within any, anywhere of Harrisburg. Um, we generally are building one of a couple models. Um, and lots are, are preferred, easiest to convert where we're building either single family or duplexes built to rent. Um, but we're also um, in a position and able to convert larger parcels of land that could be taken through the entitlement phase. And we're doing one now where we have um, the ability to build 11 homes on, uh, I think it's about a 12 acre parcel of land that we bought from a, um, an investor that had, had locked up that, that, that opportunity and brought it to us. And then we have the ability through some partnerships to build large uh, multifamily communities. So I would say like literally um, anything that can be built on within an hour and a half to two hour range um, of Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, of something that would be of um, significant interest. All right. And how do people get a hold of you? Um, I'm on Facebook. I'm on Instagram. I'm on TikTok. Um, you can look me up um, on Instagram. It's Eric Brewer underscore invest. Um, just search for Eric Brewer on Facebook. Jack and I, I believe are friends on Facebook. So if yep. you're friends with Jack, you should be able to find me pretty easily. Um, that's the best way to, to get a hold of me is to, to track me down on social media. And then I'm pretty responsive to, you know, direct messages and stuff like that. Awesome. Well, wonderful. Well, thank you very much for being here and enlightening us about the concept of uh, of, of innovation. Also, congratulations to your oh. mother's success here with 400 deals um, a, a year. And uh, with that said, I mean, that really concludes our session here. Thank you for making, making time for us. So with that said, guys, yeah. everyone, if you enjoyed that, please share it. Please give us five stars. Please invite other people to follow us. The more people we have on our podcast, the more impact we can make on here. All right. So with that said, thank you very much.